Okay, for this presentation we're going to be talking about teamwork and conflict. Very, very fun subjects. Now, why is teamwork important? Well, this is one of those topics that no matter how many times I teach it, I still find people who want to try to argue that teamwork doesn't work out that well. That, you know what, I've done it before, it doesn't work, I don't like teams, I don't like being on a team, teamwork just slows everything down. <sighs> Well, sorry to tell you, teamwork does actually work, if done right, and that's the main caveat. Anyone who's trying to say that teamwork is not effective, at least in a general sense, is like me trying to prove that donuts are the key to weight loss and fitness. We're trying really, really hard, and it does not work. Anyway, we've tried to test this, done studies, seeing what's more effective, Teams are more effective than individuals in most cases. There are times when an individual is the only one who can do it, but if you're able to put teamwork into it, things get better. So, we're going to talk about it, and we'll never stop talking about it. That's always going to be around. So, increased productivity, some of the things where you can get from teamwork. 20% more productive than comparable GE workforces elsewhere. Increased speed, reduced costs, improved quality, reduced destructive internal competition. So, instead of competing with each other we take a teamwork approach to it and improved workplace cohesiveness people are happier on teams when it's working now do teams always work absolutely not I've been on some disastrous teams and others that were quite wonderful okay but overall it is worthwhile to try to make this work in fact it's worthwhile to try forever to get this working and functioning in your companies. So, the five stages of group and team development. This is one of those things that once you learn it, the next time you're in a team, you're going to watch this and go, oh yeah, we talked about this. Okay, the forming stage. Getting oriented, getting acquainted. This is when everyone is still playing nice. Those who are later going to become dragons are still playing nice. And, oh, it's so wonderful to be on this team. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to get so much done. And it's just all kind of kumbaya and everyone's happy in the forming. Okay? And we're introducing ourselves. We're talking about what we're going to do, etc., etc. Everything is still nice. Then comes the storming. All right, Individual personalities and roles emerge. Here's where we're going to try and figure out who's going to fight for leadership. Who's going to cause trouble, who's going to be the jerk, who's going to be annoying, who's going to not want to do anything. Well, we're going to fight through that in storming. Now, most people who have had bad experiences with teamwork, who say teamwork does not work, generally stalled out right there. Okay, That's as far as they got. If that's where you stop, yeah, teamwork is not fun at all. Because you have this massive fight, and people don't want to work together, and oh, why are we doing this, and blah, 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 and it all ends. Well, if that's where you stop, yeah, that's not going to work out very well. Now, if you're thinking about sports teams, of work teams, of three-legged races, you're going to see these stages. If you, I mean, three-legged races might be a little bit short. Give me a couple of races, we're going to we're going to get through this. Norming, okay, our next stage. Our conflicts resolved, relationships are now starting to develop, and we're going to start to pull together as a team. At this point in norming, when things start to kind of click, is when you start to see, okay, here's what we're supposed to be seeing, here's when we can start to make a difference, but you have to get past the storming first. So norming is when we start to see things start to click. All right. Performing is when you ha now have a team that has gone through storming, they are now normed out, and we're ready to get some things done. And here's where you see all the productivity, the efficiency, the speed, all the things that we want from teamwork, we can now get in the performing stage. Okay, The adjourning stage is when the project is over, the team is no longer going to be around, and we are going to adjourn. Okay, So, all teams go through this. If you're doing a team project right now, you've gone through some form of these stages. Okay, Week one, you're talking about things you're forming. When things start to get a little bit rough, you start in the storming, you get to norming, hopefully you get to performing by the time the assignment is due. Now, building effective teams require a bunch of different factors. Cooperation, trust, cohesiveness, 
performance goals and feedback, motivation, size, the appropriate size, the right roles, the correct norms, and awareness of groupthink. We're going to talk about a couple of these. How to enhance cohesiveness. How do we get the team to be really tight? Uh, you want teams such that they, they're just tight. There's a cohesiveness that you're able to see. That, you know, if you go to a meeting, they're going to sit together. If they go to lunch, they're probably going together. It's not a requirement. It's something that happens over time where you just enjoy being with your team, and there's a certain amount of almost a familial sense to it. Uh, keep the team small, relatively. We're going to talk about size here in a moment. Encourage interaction and cooperation. Emphasize the members' common characteristics. In teams, you're going to have a lot of complementary skills. In other words, don't want a whole bunch of people who all have exactly the same skill set. That's just a group. It's not really a team. But emphasize what is common so you can build on that. Strive for a favorable public image to enhance the team's prestige. Uh, this is a lot of times in the hands of the manager and how they talk about that team and what they're doing. Give each member stake in the team's success. So it's not just for the good of the team. It's what do I get if this all works out. Point out threats to the team from competitors. Ensure that standards are clear. Regularly update the members. That's just good practice anyway. Frequently remind members they need each other to get the job done. Reinforce the importance of teamwork. But yeah, you might want to go off on your own. If you do, you're going to fail. Uh, direct each member's special talents toward the common goals, hence the complementary skills and recognize each member's contributions. It's nice to talk about the entire team, but you bolster the entire team if you talk about each member and what they bring to the table. Otherwise, you end up with people who think that they are not needed, and that's a bad thing. So, small teams or large teams? Small teams are between two and nine members. Better interaction, meaning you've got everybody working on stuff. Better morale, because it's very tight, close-knit. Disadvantages, fewer resources, fewer people adding ideas possibly less innovation depending on the members and sometimes we have an unfair work distribution if we have too much stuff depending on how that all sets up large teams are 10 to 16 more resources better division of labor but less interaction one of these people over here could be thinking about dinner instead of really having to interact because there's other people there lower morale I'm part of this great big team. I don't know what's going on. And then the social loafing is when you have somebody saying, I'm part of a team. I don't have to do any work at all. I still get credit. Yeah, we've all been in teams where that happens, by the way. Every single one of us. Team size, Amazon.com rule. There's a two pizza rule. Team can't be fed by two pieces. pizzas. It's too large. Not a bad rule. Unless there's someone like me in there, in which case that's going to be a problem. Now, Harvard professor says so it should be no more than, no more than six. And other companies have their own ideal sizes. They've kind of come up with their own idea on that. But you will see people pushing toward as small as possible. Now, groupthink. There are times when you get a group of people together and they come up with an idea. And just from the nature of the team, of the group, they all kind of band together and say, yes, that is correct. Even if somebody on that team is likely saying, you know what, that doesn't actually sound good if you pitched it to them individually, because of the team dynamics, they may get behind something that actually doesn't make a lot of sense. This is when individuals on the team shy away from conflict. They start saying, um, whatever the team wants. Okay, Groupthink ends up with a lot less, a lot fewer ideas, especially alternate ideas. Limiting of other information. This means that if you're in this team and somebody, especially if it's the leader figure, says, we should do this, and everybody around you says, yes, that's a wonderful idea, and you're going, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard is going to fail. Do you speak up inside of this cohesive team where everyone is just happy? Do you introduce conflict to a team? Most people, this is extreme peer pressure we t heard about in high school, are going to say, okay, whatever the group wants. Well, that is working counter to what a team is supposed to do. A team is supposed to be innovative, supposed to be creative, supposed to create things that other people can't. If we get into a group thing situation, we have a problem. So, to prevent it, we allow criticism, we allow other perspectives. The problem with that is it creates conflict. Okay, Meaning we're all sitting in a meeting and I have this wonderful idea and you speak up and say, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we can do better. Or I think that's horrible. Well, what do we do now? We now have conflict because we can't just 
go on our merry way and say, yes, everyone's agreeing, it's perfect. Okay, It's the one juror saying, I don't think he's guilty. Stuff like that. Now, there are different types of conflict. We have dysfunctional conflict. This actually hinders everything. We do not want this stuff. This is, if you think about it, this is primarily attacking other people. Functional conflict might attack ideas, but not people. If you think that I'm a moron, and therefore you're going to attack anything that I say because you think I'm an idiot, that's dysfunctional conflict. Because, well, I might be a moron, but it's not going to help anything. Because you're doing it because of personal reasons, you don't like me, and you're going to come after all of my ideas. That's dysfunctional because I might have some good ideas. And going against everything I say is not productive. Functional conflict is saying, you know, we can do better than that. I'm not sure I like this idea. Let's work on it some more and let's see if we can come up with something better. You'd be amazed at what happens in brainstorming and this functional conflict when people are trying to find a, the best solution. Okay? Now, <coughs> excuse me, the way this works best, um, if you have really low conflict, meaning everyone's just, yep, 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 everyone nodding their heads, the yes men nodding people, bobbleheads, uh, your performance is really low. You have no really good ideas because everyone's just going along with the flow. If you have really high levels of conflict, <laughs> nothing much gets done because we're fighting all the time. You want an optimal level right here in the middle where you have enough to where we're challenging ideas, we're coming up with new things, There's we're eliminating groupthink as much as possible, but we're not fighting all the time. Okay. Now, some conflict handling styles. Avoiding. Maybe the problem will go away. Well, that doesn't work at all. Uh, sometimes your company can go away before anyone pipes up and says, this was a bad idea. Accommodating. Let's do it your way. Fine. It's not worth fighting about. That's all. This is the peacekeeping that kind of bugs me when it comes to a corporate level. Someone's saying, well, let's not fight about it. Let's just, let's, let's do it your way. No. Let's do it the way that's best for the company. That way we all stay employed and the company continues to thrive. If we do it your way and your way is blatantly awful, then that's not going to work. Forcing. You have to do it my way. Add in because I'm the boss and you have a bad managerial style and a bad conflict handling style. Both in one. Compromising. Let's split the difference. Yeah, the, people like compromises. It sounds good. It's actually a bad way to do things. We'll talk about that in negotiation class later on in, this, in the bachelor's degree. Um, compromising means we're going to split the difference. We're going to take half of a good idea, half of a bad idea, or half of... No. Well, one is a collaborating idea. Let's figure out what the best idea is until we can take some of the components you're talking about and what I'm talking about. We put it together. We find a new way that makes everybody happy. That's what we want out of conflict is the best. Not just your way or my way. We want the best way. Okay. Ways to stimulate this. Spur some competition. Okay. If you've got too much group thing going on, everyone's nodding their heads. Change it up. Change the organization's culture and procedures. Far easier said than done, but that'll work. Get you some, get you moving. Bring in some outsiders. Talking about hiring from outside. Bring in some of some new perspectives. Saying, actually, we've tried that somewhere else. It didn't work. Let's try this. It's worked other places. Use program conflict, which is a different set of things. Now, we've gone over this stuff rather quickly for the sake of the lecture, but I have a minute and a half, so here we go. When it comes to conflict, what you will find is that the companies that fail, not every one of them, because I can't claim that, but most of them that fail, you could go back and look at it and find somewhere in there lack of constructive conflict is the reason that they failed. Okay, Because usually there was some bad idea that either they started on that they shouldn't have, or they continued with when they should not have. And somebody should have raised their hand and said, we have a problem here, we should not do this. Uh, there was a video on conflict one time about the Apollo 13 mission. Remember that almost killed off our, our astronauts. There were people ahead of time that knew there was something wrong, that had seen things on tests that had had issues, and they did not raise the issue hard enough. They b backed away from the conflict, and then we had a, a near disaster. It was a disaster, but we nearly had a worse disaster. Going away from the conf from conflict can cause more trouble than just saying, no, I'm okay saying, no, I don't think that your idea is great, if I'm willing to work to make a better one. If that's the case, that's constructive conflict, and it can be the saving grace of a company, if you're willing to do it. Sometimes depending on culture and personalities, but it is worth it. Thank you for listening. 
Have a good week.